Are there errors in the Bible? I get asked that question a lot, and when people ask it, often what they want to know is, how do we know that the manuscripts that we have, the Greek text that we have, really reflects what Matthew wrote? Prior to the invention of the printing press, the manuscripts were copied by hand for 1,400 years. How do we know that scribes didn't change the text, or that errors haven't crept into the text? How do we know it's reliable and error-free? Well, this question has become increasingly more important in the modern day because there are skeptics out there who are raising doubts. One of the skeptics has even suggested that there are as many as 400,000 errors in the New Testament. Scribal errors, manuscript errors. That's a big number. That's far more errors than there are even words in the New Testament. How do you arrive at such a number? What I want to do in the next few minutes is talk about how errors got into the manuscripts of the New Testament, what kinds of errors scribes made, and what we ought to think about them. If you were to lay out on a table all of the manuscripts of the New Testament that exist, and there are about 6,000 of them, continuous text manuscripts down to tiny little fragments, you would find that those manuscripts differed from one another in about four key ways. The first way in which you're going to find a manuscript being different from all the others is where that manuscript's scribe just made an error. The scribe just blundered. We've all experienced this. You're making a copy of something or you're reading a paragraph and you take your eyes away and you put your eyes back and now you've skipped a line. Scribes did that. But those are easy to spot and they don't really mean anything because they're so easy to spot. The resulting error is almost always nonsense and scribes didn't copy that. If you were a scribe that had a manuscript that had such an error in it, you would fix it. You wouldn't copy it because the result doesn't make any sense. And those kinds of errors are all throughout the manuscripts of the New Testament. But they don't mean anything because, as I said, they are so easy to spot. If the manuscripts are filled with these kinds of errors, the question is, what does it mean? And the answer is, it doesn't mean much of anything. You take a modern book, like the book Misquoting Jesus by Bart Ehrman. If you turn to page 13 on this book, what you're going to find is there's a typo there. He's quoting a writer named Tim LaHaye, and he misspells his name. Well, this one error in an in otherwise error-free book, but this first printing was produced, I don't know, 100,000 copies. So how do we count that one misspelling? Do we count it as one error in this text? Or do we count it as 100,000 errors in this text? Well, to get to that astronomically large number that we started with, 400,000 errors in the text of the New Testament, you have to count all of them like that. And so if one manuscript has a reading and the author thinks that all the others are wrong and all the others exist in a thousand manuscripts, he counts that as a thousand errors, not as one. But how fair is that? Imagine if I wrote a review of Dr. Ehrman's book and in that review I said his book is filled with a hundred thousand errors because it has one typo that was copied a hundred thousand times. Would that be fair? No, and I don't think anybody would believe it. And so the manuscripts make those kinds of errors. Scribes made mistakes, and those mistakes didn't even go away with the invention of the printing press. The second kind of error that you'll find, the second kind of variant that you'll find in the manuscripts of the New Testament is what we call orthographic variants. All English speakers understand that when you move outside of the United States, words get different spellings. You pick up a magazine, and you read the word color, and it's spelled C-O-L-O-U-R, and you understand this was written by somebody who speaks English outside of the United States, probably from Britain. It's a regional spelling. Well, the manuscripts of the New Testament are filled with those kinds of regional spellings, and they're actually very helpful because they often help us identify what part of the world an ancient manuscript came from. But to arrive at that 400,000 number, 400,000 variations in all these manuscripts, you have to count every single time somebody regionally spells a word. Imagine if we did that with a regular book. Imagine if we had an English copy of Harry Potter and we had an American copy of Harry Potter and every time the word color was spelled C-O-L-O-U-R, we said, this text makes an error. It's ridiculous. Nobody thinks that way. And we shouldn't think that way about the New Testament. Scribes in different parts of the world just conformed the spellings to the local spelling. And the manuscripts are filled with those. And that makes up a huge chunk of that 400,000 number that we hear. The third kind of variant that you'll find, the third kind of way in which these manuscripts disagree from one another, are what we call minor, non-translatable variants. Now this one's technical, so hang with me. There are a number of minor variants among the manuscripts of the New Testament that never show up in translation, but they are there. And they're important to textual critics for helping us identify where manuscripts came from and how they were produced give you a little Greek lesson. In Greek, it is often common to put the definite article in front of a proper name. We wouldn't do that. We wouldn't say the Ed Gravely. We would just say Ed Gravely. But in Greek, 
they'll put the definite article in front of a proper name. Well, if the definite article accidentally gets dropped out of a manuscript, a scribe makes an error, he skips it, whatever, that's minor. It's never going to show up in an English translation. And the huge chunk, another huge chunk of that 400,000 are those kinds of minor, non-translatable variants. So what we're left with then is we're left with the major translatable variants. The ones that you have notes about in the, uh, the footnotes in your Bible that say the oldest and best manuscripts read such and such. But that's a very tiny fraction of that 400,000. In fact, it really only is a couple of dozen that are going to show up in footnotes that you're really going to have to pay attention to. And there are some famous ones. The long ending of Mark. The story of the woman caught in adultery in John 8. And work still needs to be done. Scholars still need to work on these things. But they're not sufficient reason to doubt the truthfulness of the New Testament. They're not sufficient reason to doubt that the New Testament hasn't been transmitted to us in a reasonably careful fashion. In fact, I as a New Testament professor will often tell my students, all right, when you go home and read this passage, there's a major textual variant there. I want you to pay attention to it. And they come back the next day and they couldn't find it. They don't know what I'm talking about. And it's because, say in Romans 10, some manuscripts read, faith comes by hearing the word of God, and some manuscripts read, faith comes by hearing the word of Christ. And they discovered that as students, and they played it in their head. Faith comes by hearing the word of God, what does that mean? Faith comes by hearing the word of Christ, what does that mean? And they came to the conclusion, it means exactly the same thing. And so they dismissed it as being important. Now to a textual critic, that kind of variant is really important, because that kind of reading didn't occur by accident. Something happened in the text to get Christ or God. That's a major one to a guy like me. But in terms of the reliability of the New Testament, in terms of errors, it's absolutely minor. What does it all mean? Well, one of the things it means is that there are skeptics out there that really are exaggerating the data. If you laid all the manuscripts of the New Testament out, are there 400,000 differences? There are. But when you look at it carefully, what does it mean? It means really very little. And in fact, there are those out there who are using these kinds of arguments to simply ignore the scripture, to claim that we don't know what Paul said, so how can we believe it? And that's just not the case. Don't use skeptical questions about the New Testament as an excuse not to read your Bible. Don't use skeptical questions as an excuse to deny the claims of Christianity, because the excuses are pretty flimsy when the evidence is examined carefully.